Resurgence of Xi Jinping's First Lady? Unemployment surge, many monks, not enough porridge as anti-war sentiment soar. Scholars predict, China's economic crisis to persist for 50 years. Local government debt and China soars to crisis levels. Moscow terror attack sparks panic among Chinese, return flight tickets prices soar. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Resurgence of Xi Jinping's First Lady? Since Xi Jinping started his third term, his wife, Peng Liyuan, has ramped up her solo political endeavors. In the current CCP political scene, the emergence of Peng is drawing more eyes than ever. A fresh piece by the CCP state media reveals that Xi Jinping, alongside Chen Xiaoming, the CCP secretary for Hunan province, and Governor Mao Weiming, made rounds to Changsha, Changda, among other locations, from March 18 to March 21. On March 24, the CCP's National Health Commission spotlighted on its official web front page Peng Liyuan's visit to Changsha, Hunan, along with the deputy director of the National Health Commission, a senior CCP official in Hunan and the executive deputy governor, for a deep dive into grassroots tuberculosis prevention and control efforts, complete with photos and videos. Peng Liyuan is also known as the Hu Goodwill Ambassador for Tuberculosis and HIV AIDS Prevention. Judging by the timelines, it seems Peng Liyuan came to Changsha with Xi Jinping, though she didn't appear in the reports about her. Besides these engagements, Peng Liyuan has also made solo appearances at several international events lately. On January 24, Peng Liyuan met one-on-one -on -one with the wife of the Uzbek president, Mirzio Yiva. While it's unusual for Chinese president's spouses to hold solo meetings with international guests, Peng Liyuan has been actively involved in China's foreign affairs for several years, underscoring her growing influence within the CCP. Last November, Peng attended the funeral of former Premier Li Keqiang, positioning herself behind Xi Jinping but ahead of others. This departure from past protocol, compared to her absence at the farewells of former Premiers Li Peng and Jiang Zemin, has led to speculation about her aspirations, possibly with Xi Jinping's backing, to secure a spot as the 25th member of the Politburo. Commenting on this, current affairs commentator Lu Ruixiao suggests that the absence of the third plenary session last year might indicate internal issues within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the rocket force, but it also raises the possibility of Xi Jinping once again breaking tradition. There's talk that she wants Peng Liyuan on the Politburo. Currently, the CCP Politburo has 24 members, an even number with no female representation, deviating from tradition. Peng Liyuan's inclusion could address these disparities. However, she's not even a central committee member presently, making it a significant leap for her to enter the Politburo, let alone its standing committee. Given the CCP's historical practices, this poses a considerable challenge. According to Song Yongi, a cultural revolution historian and retired professor from California State University, Los Angeles, whether Peng Liyuan can join the Politburo depends on two factors, how ambitious Peng Liyuan is, and in how much the dictator Xi Jinping needs her to achieve his goals. Song notes that the rise of the Shandong faction within the CCP's political and military sphere suggests that Peng's role in the political landscape may be seriously underestimated. Unemployment surge, many monks, not enough porridge as anti-war sentiment soar. Media reports indicate that China's economic recovery is falling short of expectations. New statistical methods introduced last December reveal rising unemployment among those aged 16 to 24, 25 to 29, and 30 to 50, excluding students, month by month. Even Beijing's renowned gig market, Majukio, is experiencing a glut of workers chasing too few jobs with unpredictable pay. This market, one of 6,900 across the country, is famously considered a last resort for those facing hard times, encapsulated by the saying, if you're down on your luck, Majukio is worth a shot. However, the landscape has changed. Majukio now faces intense competition, age discrimination, and declining wages. The scene comes to life before sunrise, buzzing with middle-aged men armed with toolboxes, eagerly surrounding any vehicle that arrives with potential work. The daily wage has plummeted to 150 yuan, 
about 20 US dollars and 82 cents, for a full day and 80 yuan for half, about 11 US dollars and 10 cents, without meal provisions, paid out daily. Jobs are quickly snapped up, even at rates nearly half of what they once were. Employers favor the strong and relatively young, often rejecting anyone over 42. Workers lament the difficulty in finding jobs and earning a decent wage, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic and recent political events that have led to factory shutdowns, reflecting the broader challenges in the manufacturing and consumer sectors. Official data from 2022 shows China's migrant worker population at 300 million, with over half aged 40 and above, highlighting an aging workforce. The rising youth unemployment rate further complicates their dire situation, forcing migrant workers to tirelessly search for any available work to survive. Tao Wang, a researcher at the University of Manchester's Manchester China Institute, noted in foreign policy that CCP Foreign Minister Wang Yi declared the 1.4 billion Chinese people's unwavering determination for reunification with Taiwan. Yet, the prevailing public reaction on Douyin opposes war unless for self-defense, highlighting widespread dissatisfaction and resistance. Among them, a guy from Shanghai vented, who's itching for a fight. If I bite the dust, who's gonna cover my mortgage and car payments? Public responses to official narratives framing national reunification as a core interest call for prioritizing equal treatment and access to welfare over geopolitical ambitions. Some suggest Taiwan's self-determination might offer a suggestive alternative path for China. There were also those asking, how does taking Taiwan by force benefit us regular folks, and why not scrap those special perks, equalize retirement plans across the board, and have the Republic of China bring the mainland together? On March 20, John Aquilino, leading the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command as a Navy admiral, laid it out in front of the House Armed Services Committee. Despite economic hurdles, China's military spending has spiked by 16% recently, topping $223 billion. He laid out the evidence that the Chinese military is gearing up on Xi Jinping's orders, aiming to make a move on Taiwan before 2027. According to Aquilino, if she decides it's go time, his military is ready to force Taiwan into unification, sticking to his preferred schedule. Scholars predict China's economic crisis to persist for 50 years. Previously, Taiwanese chief economist Wu Jialong pointed out China is grappling with four heavy-duty crises, a housing market meltdown, soaring unemployment, a ballooning debt problem, and deflation. These crises are hitting all at once, posing a significant challenge for China's export-dependent economy, essentially boiling down to a single burning question, where will the future orders come from? On March 22, Wu revisited Facebook to remind folks that the CCP pulled the Chinese economy back from the brink 20 years ago through reforms and opening up. The key to why China didn't crash and burn then was the United States' wholehearted support, which opened up its markets to Chinese exports. But, Wu argues, the CCP either didn't get the memo or just refuses to admit that, choosing confrontation over cooperation with the U.S. Now, with the U.S. pulling back its support, China's economic stability is in jeopardy. The U.S. is moving towards economic decoupling, pulling orders and banning sensitive tech, which leaves China struggling to keep up competitively, guarantee jobs, and collect taxes. China's banking system is swamped with bad loans, and local governments are facing a worsening financial crisis, with both financial and fiscal stress building up. Wu forecasts a grim outlook for China, foreseeing a lost 30 years, maybe even lost 50 years, primarily due to two inescapable structural crises, a demographic dilemma and a crisis of confidence. Wu highlights how, unlike the CCP, which can't dodge its demographic and confidence crises, Taiwan, Japan, and the US are trending upwards long term. This upward trajectory is reflected in the stock markets of the US, Japan, and Taiwan, all hitting record highs, while the stock markets in China and Hong Kong are floundering. Wu quips that if you draw the line at the Taiwan Strait, the east side with Taiwan, Japan, and the US is on the rise, while the west side with the CCP and Hong Kong is on the decline, a sort of east rise, west fall scenario. The dialogue on China's economic woes and the looming threat of collapse has ramped up internationally since last year's latter half. 
Voice of America has bleakly noted that the ship has sailed for China's economy, with no hope for patching things up. The Economist ran a cover story asking why China's economic issues remain unsolved, pinning it on a government that's becoming increasingly autocratic and consistently making poor decisions. Meanwhile, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation reports that China's economy is unraveling faster than anyone could have imagined. Local government debt in China soars to crisis levels. Local government debt in China has reached an alarming level, with the Chinese Communist Party resorting to frequent issuance of special bonds to mitigate the crisis. According to documents from the China Bond Information Network, Guizhou Province recently issued special refinancing bonds on March 18. This marks the sixth issuance of such bonds by the provincial government over the past six months, with total issuance amounting to approximately $39 billion, highlighting the ongoing struggle to manage local debt. Unlike regular refinancing bonds, where the raised funds are used to repay maturing government bond principal, the funds raised from special refinancing bonds are used to replace local implicit debt. Since October 2023, local authorities across China have issued special bonds with proceeds collectively amounting to $208 billion thus far. However, experts warn that this may not suffice to address the magnitude of the issue. This trend is likely to continue with more provinces issuing additional such bonds to cover their debt repayment. Beijing has a history of resorting to such measures, with two significant peaks in special refinancing bond issuance occurring in recent years. The current scale and pace of special refinancing bond issuance far surpasses those of previous rounds. Beijing issues special national bonds. At the recent two sessions conference, Beijing revealed plans to issue ultra-long-term special national bonds yearly, starting with 1 trillion yuan, $139 billion, this year, as Premier Li Chang highlighted in the government's work report. These bonds are earmarked for major national strategies and enhancing security in critical areas, though details remain vague. Economist Wu Jialong said that the strategy, arguing it essentially absolves the current government of repayment duties, suggesting a default might be anticipated from the outset. He pointed out that if Beijing's government were to collapse within a decade, these debts wouldn't be repaid, if it lasts several decades, future administrations would be burdened with this debt. This approach, he argues, isn't about borrowing to repay but preparing for default. Historically, Beijing has turned to special national bonds in times of crisis, like the 1998 Asian financial crisis, the 2007 global financial crisis, and the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. The frequency of issuing these bonds has increased, with the most recent rounds announced within less than six months of each other, and plans to continue issuing them for several years. This uptick is seen by many analysts as a response to severe local debt challenges. Despite the central government's stance that local authorities should resolve their own financial issues, the reality is that local debts could pose systemic risks. Wu emphasized the necessity of paying civil servants and armed police and maintaining public security, asserting that the stability maintenance system must remain operational. He underscored that local debt directly impacts social and regime stability. China's debt crisis attracts attention. In recent times, China's local government debt has ballooned, hitting a record $1.3 trillion in bond issuances in 2023 alone. Out of this, $647 billion were new issuances, a slight 2% drop from the previous year, and $650 billion were for refinancing, marking a staggering 79% increase year over year. Since 2018, the practice of refinancing old debts with new bonds has exploded, jumping from $94.7 billion to an increase of 687% just last year. These new bonds generally finance major ongoing projects, whereas refinancing bonds are effectively used to pay off older debts. The reliance on new debt for repayment puts increasing pressure on the financial health of these local governments, as their ability to secure new funding is critical for their cash flow. The financial stability of local governments has traditionally depended on income from land sales. Yet, with the downturn in China's real estate market, revenues from these sales have sharply declined, forcing local governments into a cycle of issuing new bonds to cover old debts. By the end of 2023, 
the disclosed local government debt stood over $5.5 trillion, but this figure only includes explicit debt. Implicit debt, which is harder to quantify, is estimated by experts like the International Monetary Fund and investment banks to be between $7 trillion and $11 trillion. Combining these, economist Mr. Wu estimates China's total local government debt could be around $14.6 trillion, surpassing 83% of China's GDP, which was $17.5 trillion last year. Wu anticipates that this heavy reliance on debt will shrink both consumer spending and investment, leading to deflation, where prices drop across the board. This deflationary spiral is expected to hit the stock and real estate markets hard, potentially dragging China's entire economy into a prolonged downturn, reminiscent of Japan's lost three decades. Despite efforts to pump more money into the economy to boost spending and stimulate growth, this strategy has largely resulted in increased savings and deposits. With a prevailing crisis of confidence, people and businesses are hoarding cash, fearful of spending or investing, leading to a liquidity trap where all new money is effectively absorbed without stimulating economic activity. Mr. Wu foresees a long-term deflationary period for China's economy, potentially outstripping Japan's prolonged economic stagnation. Moscow terror attack sparks panic among Chinese, return flight tickets prices soar. On the evening of March 22, a terrorist attack hit the Crocus City Hall in Moscow's Krasnogorsk district, leaving 133 dead by the next evening, a toll expected to climb. ISIS took responsibility for the devastating event. This triggered widespread fear among the Chinese in Moscow, with harrowing accounts emerging from the scene. As reported by Red Star News, a Chinese student in Russia, caught dining near the venue, recounted the chaos that unfolded following a massive explosion. Initially mistaking it for a drone strike, the situation quickly escalated, prompting a frantic dash to safety amid sounds that mimicked gunfire. A Chinese vlogger in Moscow noted the palpable tension among the local Chinese community, with police presence significantly ramped up throughout the city, even late into the night. In the aftermath, flight prices from Moscow to China soared, from a previous round-trip ticket cost of only 4,000 yuan, about 555 US dollars, to a staggering 20,000 yuan, about 2,775 US dollars, for one way. This sharp increase in airfare led to a wave of backlash online, especially on Weibo, where many expressed their frustration over the transportation sector exploiting the crisis. Further conversations with Chinese students revealed a halt in academic activities, with many opting to stay indoors. Trade exhibitors from China found themselves in a bind, their business agendas derailed by the attack and left in limbo about their return plans. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths. Thank you.